Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the Thinking Crypto channel. I have a very special guest with me, Brad Garlinghouse, the CEO of Ripple. Brad, great to be speaking with you today. Tony, honored to be here. Thanks for inviting me and uh, putting a lot of questions out to <laughs> let people participate. That was great. Well, Brad, you know, everybody wants to talk to you about Ripple and XRP, but I want to take it things back a bit and I want to learn about you and where did you grow up? Where are you from? I'm originally from Kansas. Uh, I grew up there, uh, born there, went to college at the University of Kansas, a, a proud Jayhawk, although I sometimes have to pretend we don't have a football team. Uh, it's just all about <laughs> college basketball. Uh, but I still describe, you know, I've lived in California now for 24 uh, years. I still describe myself as a Kansan first and foremost. Got it. And, you know, tell us about your time in Silicon Valley. You were at AOL, you were at Yahoo. You know, how did you get started in Silicon Valley and how did that lead to you ending up at Ripple? You know, I've always been uh, a bit of a techie and did some coding earlier in my career or not career, but really even in school, I guess. And, uh, you know, when you come out of school and I finished business school in 1997 uh, and you know, the internet is booming, you know, I, I do think, and as I'm, I'm sure we'll talk about given last week's news with uh, the Coinbase IPO, you know, I remember where I was the day that Netscape went public in 1995. And, uh, you know, the, the expression when in Rome, you know, if, if you were interested in this segment of the economy in, you know, the, the late 90s, you, you wanted to be in the Bay Area uh, and in Silicon Valley. And so I, I moved out here in 1997. And as you pointed out, I've done a, a few different uh, positions at smaller companies, bigger companies, and spend a little bit of time on both the investment side of the world as well as the operating side. Got it. And when you were at Yahoo, you famously penned the peanut butter manifesto. Can you tell us a bit about that and where you see Yahoo today, given <laughs> since you penned uh, that letter? <laughs> you know, look, I'll start by saying I have such a fond set of memories from my experience working at Yahoo. The, the people, the culture in many ways was just a, a really fabulous time. Uh, I, I do think like many companies, uh, you know, you spread yourself thin, you get excited about new opportunities. And, uh, you know, at that time, uh, you know, Yahoo, I think was a little bit confused about what it was trying to be. And, you know, was it trying to be a search engine? Was it trying to be a content platform with, you know, Yahoo News, Yahoo Sports, uh, Yahoo Finance, and even fantasy sports stuff. And then, of course, Yahoo had a robust set of kind of application products like Yahoo Mail. And at the time, Yahoo Mail was much bigger than Gmail mm -hmm. and actually uh, continued to grow after Gmail launched quite substantially. But, uh, you know, it, it's sad for me to see kind of what has kind of got you know, Yahoo now, as many people know, has been absorbed within the, the Verizon media empire. And, uh, you know, I think relative to where it was back in the... Uh, early 2000s, you know, it's, it's not quite the same, but I'm, I'm still a loyal uh, user of some of the Yahoo products. Wow. I, I was actually, I heard some news recently of Yahoo Answers. I think they're sunsetting it, which kind of made me sad. It's such a huge part of the internet legacy. Yeah. Yeah. I think that Yahoo Answers is one, you know, Yahoo Groups used to be in my group at Yahoo. I, I ran everything from the homepage to Yahoo Mail and some other things. And Yahoo Groups was in my uh, organization and we we actually sunsetted Yahoo Groups when I was there and the reason was and I think the reason I'm bringing this up is I, I think you know the, the the internet and the social media as we know it today could learn from this it, Yahoo Groups we realized that our ability to uh, the, the cost relative to the benefit of monitoring Yahoo Groups for the abusive behaviors and the illegal activity uh, made it untenable like we couldn't really operate the service uh efficiently and as i have said very publicly and i think you may know i sued personally i sued youtube and ripple sued youtube because so many people are impersonating me uh using ripple's brand to scam people and you know i think a number a number of the social media platforms really uh can and should 
be more a part of the solution than I think they have been. I think that the platforms have been abused in ways that have you know uh, hurt society in some ways. And I'm, you may also know there's a really powerful documentary on Netflix called The Social Dilemma, mm. which I thought was you know really impactful and uh, made sure my kids watched it. Yeah, it, it's certainly a problem because I, I get impersonators on my channel and it's on Twitter, it's on Facebook. It's, it's hard to keep up with. It's kind of ridiculous at this point. Um, hopefully your lawsuit <laughs> is going to force some changes, but we'll see what happens. Yeah, um, I think it brings attention to it. I don't think it's going to you know, force changes, but I think uh, you know, what I find most frustrating, which sounds like you've experienced also, is you identify someone representing, you know, pretending to be you and trying to scam people and you report it and you know, it takes days and sometimes even weeks for it to come down. I actually had one time that was kind of funny. I did tweet about this, it was quite some time ago, but I reported a fake account on Instagram with someone impersonating me and Instagram wrote back saying, hey, we've looked into this, thank you for reporting it, we take it seriously and we've concluded that this is not an impersonation. And she's like, wait, that's a picture of me. <laughs> <laughs> got to be kidding right now well certainly the industry that we're in blockchain uh could certainly solve that right if if the profiles were created and tagged to the blockchain and that verification yeah. is there you know it's kind of funny you mentioned this when i first joined uh ripple and i just passed my, my six-year anniversary of the company we actually were working on three different uh you know but it also interrelates with the peanut butter manifesto comment but Ripple is working on three different kind of go-to-market initiatives, leveraging the XRP ledger. One of them was uh, a global ID project, the idea of using a blockchain mm -hmm. for identity management. Uh, the other one's a smart contract platform. This is, I think, you know, somewhat infamously Vitalik Buterin uh, spent some time as an intern and sleeping on the couch of our CTO at the time, Stefan Thomas. And the third was uh, payments related and particularly cross-border payments. And we decided to pick one and focus. And it was kind of the lesson I had learned around the peanut butter manifesto of really you know, decide what you're going to be great at and invest heavily and, and grow that segment. But the, the global ID, to your point, the, leveraging a blockchain for identity management, I think, is a very real opportunity. I think it's a hard one mm -hmm. to do well in part because you know whether we like it or not today the government owns our identity right if you say to someone hey verify your identity generally you're going to look for a passport some sort of state issued identification a birth certificate you know all those things are issued by the government and so i think to do identity well today i think there has to be some collaboration and partnering with government entities, which makes it uh, maybe a little harder to scale and grow in the way that I, I think some technologies can. Sure, and I'm assuming you're up to speed with uh, what Greg Kidd is doing, um, obviously a Ripple investor in Global ID and the work they're doing on that front. Yes, and uh, look, nothing would make me happier than to see that be massively successful uh, to, to the point you and I were just talking about, it, it would help you know, the, the Instagrams and YouTubes of the world would point out how hard their job is. And if Greg Kidd and team are successful, I think that's that's good for those platforms also. Got it. Um, so I wanted to know about uh, Michael Arrington. He has published some interesting photos of you, you feeding goats and all kinds of things. How did you become friends? And uh, are we expecting more releases or uh, ICOs or something of, of your photos? <laughs> God, I hope not. <laughs> an NFT of the goat photo, or, or the, the Boy Scout photo was the particularly embarrassing one. But <laughs> you know, Mike, I consider a good friend. I've known him uh, probably a couple decades, and you know, kind of early on in his creation of TechCrunch, uh, a, a, a a Ripple employee who now works at Ripple named Kirsten Holler was first introduced Mike and I, and. I, you know, one of the things I've always liked about Mike is he, he will speak truth. And even if it's a controversial truth, you know, it, his truth sometimes. But, you know, I think sometimes uh, that's uh, an underappreciated uh, perspective on uh, in other people. And so I may not always agree with Mike, but I always respect his opinion. And I always uh, have, you know, appreciated his friendship and uh, really enjoy spending time with him. So on that note of uh, photos of you and things along those lines, the dichotomy of working at Yahoo and being in Silicon Valley to now 
being head of one of the companies that is getting maximum visibility and now you have memes and conspiracy theories and I'm so curious to get your perspective how do you feel about that how do you and Chris and the other folks at Ripple and how do you handle that well I mean maybe answer that a couple different ways I mean for what it's worth, I, you know, I view myself as a pretty private person, uh, and I, you know, my my personal side of my life, I try to keep pretty private. Um, you know, look, I, I have been vocal, and I I don't try to be private as it relates to my pr- professional position, uh, and I've certainly been vocal about my strong opinions around you know what's going on in the crypto industry. Uh, regulation is certainly, I'm sure, something we'll spend a good amount of time talking about. You know, most of the memes I just find to be comical. And, you know, like I, I admit sometimes I, I have a sense of humor and I like to have fun. And so I think sometime, maybe it was over the weekend or maybe it was last Friday, you know, I was reading Twitter and there was somebody <laughs> talking about that there's going to be a movie of th- this story, which <laughs> would not surprise me at this point. Nothing would surprise me. Uh, and I just was kind of joking around just to see who people thought would play me in a movie, uh, which there are some pr- pretty funny answers out there. Got it. Got it. Um, so I want to ask before we go into the SEC and Ripple and XRP and so forth, you know, what was your first encounter with cryptocurrencies? Was it Bitcoin? How did you hear about it? And, and what are you holding in your crypto portfolio? You know, I attended a conference hosted by a gentleman, Oren Hoffman and Peter Thiel called Dialogue. And the conference has kind of evolved since uh, the earliest days, but it was a conference in Utah, uh, 2012 or 2013. And uh, th- there's various kind of, it's, it's not so much a conference where you have, you know, a presenter presenting something to a hundred or a thousand people. It tends to be, you know, a group, a small group of maybe 10 or 12 people around a conference table where one person has been designated as leading the dialogue. And, you know, there's topics that, you always know nothing about. And it's an interesting cross-section of government, even some military and techies. And uh, there was a session in 2012, 2013 on Bitcoin. Hmm. I'd never heard of Bitcoin. Uh, And, you know, some of the people who I consider, uh, the people I respect the most even today as early uh, visionaries around what Bitcoin could mean and what digital assets could mean. Uh, And I, I remember returning to the Bay Area after that uh, conference and buying some Bitcoin. And, uh, you know, today I'm, you know, I've talked about the fact that I'm long Bitcoin. I remain a a bull and I'm I'm frankly very bullish on the the future of Bitcoin. And then of course I have plenty of exposure to XRP as another digital asset. Got it. So no Ethereum, nothing else, no, no Cardano or anything like that. You know, look, I, I'm just not, I don't view myself as a trader. And I think, you know, some people who, you know, uh, are, are they're traders and they're you know, doing lots of these different things. I, I, I'm i very busy with all things Ripple. And so I think to do that well, you kind of have to pay more attention to what's going on. Uh, I, I guess I am miss, you know, I, one thing I should have in full disclosure before I joined Ripple, uh, I was an angel investor in a company called Protocol Labs, which uh, is behind Filecoin. So I think I have exposure to Filecoin also. Got it. All right. Let's switch gears and talk about the SEC lawsuit and everything that's going on. I have quite a few questions, but things are moving so fast, so rapidly. And could you give us a state of the union here of like, where are we at? What discussions are you having with the SEC right now? The case and all of that, if you can. Sure. And, it, you know, look, as, as you and I talked a bit as we organized this, you know, there's some questions I may, you know, explicitly dodge and just say, and there's others I may just, you know, kind of answer around it. You know, suffice it to say, I think it's very clear, and what I said at the very beginning of this, when the SEC announced their intent to bring the lawsuit, uh, I think the SEC is wrong on the facts. I think they're wrong on the law. Uh, I think how we have seen this play out is demonstrating some of that. Uh, you know, this is not a, it, I actually agree it has moved, you know, a reasonably good clip, you know, but by the same token, 
the the engine of the justice system isn't necessarily you know super fast and so uh you know we, we've got a long way to go uh I, I remain hopeful that you know as time progresses there'll be additional opportunities to engage the sec in conversations about what could be a constructive outcome here that's you know provides the clarity uh that frankly ripple and i have sought for a long time and even you know pounded the table about uh but but also give the the entrepreneurs and investors and here in the united states the ability to participate in these markets and continue to grow them here at home uh you know there have been a couple of pretty consequential rulings from the court in the last uh couple, three weeks. Uh, you know, I think the, to me, the most important one amongst those was the, the judge's uh, decision to allow discovery around uh, the SEC's decision to de determine that, to, to publicly state anyway, that Ether is not a security mm -hmm. and that Bitcoin is not a security. Um, and, I, you know, like, I, I think it's even interesting, like why they wouldn't, why they fought that uh, you know, if we want to provide clarity and transparency to the market, let's provide that. Let's actually do that. And so, uh, you know, I was pleased that you know the, the, the judge ruled in our favor on that one. Do you feel there's some sort of conflict of interest here on Jay Clayton's part, given where him and Mr. William Hillman, um, the places they find themselves now at, with e in connections to Ethereum and so on and so forth? Yeah. Look, it, it, suffice it to say, it's super frustrating. Uh, you know, obviously this was a decision that was made on literally the day before Jay Clayton left his position. Uh, I, I think it's very clear Jay Clayton uh, was not a friend to the crypto industry. And uh, I think this was a, you know, on the, I think his legacy will, will show that. And Doing this the day before he left, I, I don't know. I'm not really that much of a conspiracy theorist. Certainly, the optics on some of the decisions that uh, that Jay Clayton has made since then, and certainly Bill Hinman has made since then, it don't look great. You know, the fact that Simpson Thatcher is a member of the Ethereum Enterprise Alliance, and you know he's getting paid by Simpson Thatcher while he's there. You know, those things don't look great. But you know, I, I'd like to believe that you know now that we are in front of a neutral fact finder or in front of a court, that you know we'll, we'll get to the right outcome, and I think right. that the facts will will bear that out. And I think uh, you know that, that I'm, I'm pleased about kind of how it's going so far. Got it. And what are your thoughts on Gary Genser? Obviously, well versed in crypto, he's taught at MIT. Yeah. He's spoken about Ripple, Next, RP, Bitcoin, and so on and so forth. What are your thoughts about him coming in and have you already started talks with him? You know, look, I think relative to, as we were just talking about with uh, Jay Clayton as chairman, you know, Gary Gensler comes in as truly, you know, very knowledgeable. I mean, literally he taught the class, uh, you know, I mean, that's somewhat tongue in cheek, but somewhat seriously. And so, you know, the fact that he was teaching at MIT about cryptocurrencies and, you know, as you have seen, you gave lectures about things like XRP, I think is incredibly valuable to the whole industry. I think, uh, you know, I don't think Jay Clayton deeply understood some of these technologies. Uh, you know, one of the, 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 when they announced, when Bill Hinman announced that Ethereum was not going to be viewed as a security, you know, one of the things he hung that on was this idea around decentralization. Mm -hmm. And I think they very quickly realized, well, the XRP ledger is, you know, equally, if not more so decentralized. And so that became, well, let's not talk about that anymore. Let's talk about other things. And I think, frankly, back to the discovery, I think, you know, some of those things uh, I expect we will see uh, as we get more and more discovery from the SEC. Got it. Um, and what do you think about John Deaton's, uh, the attorney, John Deaton, uh, lawsuit uh, uh, on behalf of XRP holders? You know, uh, that came as a surprise to me and I think everyone at Team Ripple. And uh, it, it's, it's fascinating to watch it because, you know, when the SEC decided to bring this lawsuit, despite having been warned by a previous SEC commissioner, uh, you know, there's a massive destruction of value, right? Uh, about $15 billion of value uh, went out of the XRP market and obviously, you know, many exchanges here in the United States halted trading of XRP. 
So I want to ask you about, in your mind, what's your ideal scenario outcome here, um, given that we have this lawsuit, we have a neutral party of the judge in place, Gary Genser coming in, what would be your ideal outcome? Well, I mean, my ideal outcome or my pragmatic outcome. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, look, and I, I've seen actually people on Twitter talk about this. You know, um, I want closure. I want clarity. You know, for people who have followed this before the lawsuit, you know, I've been saying for at least a couple of years that we have lacked clarity in the United States. In contrast, you've got major economies around the world, like the UK, like Japan, like Switzerland, like Singapore. I mean, these are not, you know, really small economies. These are big economies with robust government infrastructure that have provided the clarity that have allowed entrepreneurs, that have allowed uh, th those that would choose to speculate in digital assets to do so with, with that clarity and certainty. And here in the United States, we haven't had that. And so, it, you know, someone had said, well, maybe uh, there's a, I'm quoting a, a Twitter tweet, roughly, you know, someone had said, well, you know, if they just, if they walk away from the case, we won't have the certainty we've been looking for, you know, maybe we want to keep the case, you know, we want to get to the closure. And I kind of agree with that. You know, if, uh, if we've been asking for that for two or three years, you know, we're now for better or for worse, we're on a path to get it. And it, it's unfortunate it has to come from the courts. For better or for worse, the SEC has not gone through their, their rulemaking processes that would provide the certainty even for Bitcoin or Ether. And you know, one of the reasons why I said when the SEC first filed this lawsuit that this was an attack on crypto is because if you're going to say that about XRP, you know, where, where is that dark line where this is and that isn't? And uh, I think as more and more people are finding you know, that it's, it's a slippery slope uh, you know, even last week, I think Barry Silbert came out and said it would be, I'm paraphrasing here, but roughly speaking, he said that it would be dangerous for U.S. exchanges to uh, unhalt or relist XRP. And, it, you know, at the same time, he was removing XRP from one of his funds, but adding Chainlink, I think. Well, yeah. the, the clarity doesn't exist for Chainlink. The right. clarity, does, you know, it, it's, it's one of these like, well, wait a minute, did you really think through all of that? And it's one of the reasons why we have tried to, you know, really educate the crypto market at large that this isn't good for the whole crypto industry. Right. And, you know, really, it, it's, I think, how do we all work together and, and help create legislation, help create that clarity and that certainty? So uh, my ideal outcome, clarity and certainty uh, are first amongst them. You know, how do we get there? Well, uh, as quickly as possible, uh, I want to get there with the SEC so that uh, Ripple can operate effectively, so that lots of other companies that are operating in the XRP ecosystem can operate with that clarity and certainty. Uh, but, you know, at this point, given they have decided, they did decide to file the lawsuit, I, I, I think we need to either reach a clear settlement that provides that clarity and certainty or let the judge make that decision. Sure. And do you see another avenue, let's say the SEC can't get their act together for whatever reason, that Congress has to step in here with a token taxonomy act or change the law or President Biden, whatever, just something happens on that front. Do you see that as a possibility as well? Oh, for sure. For, 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 uh, zero doubt about that. I mean, you know, when, when there aren't clear laws, it's Congress's job to provide clear laws. And you know, to the extent I have anything nice to say about the SEC today, you know, they, they are, uh, there is a rulemaking process through which they could go about. They chose not to do that and then use enforcement as a way to try to create clarity, which I think is extremely inefficient and, you know, really bad for, in this case, Ripple and really the entire XRP community. But, you know, there was something called the Digital Commodity Exchange Act introduced in the last session of Congress. Uh, and in the, I think, Agricultural Committee. Um, and, I, you know, I, I hope that either that or something very similar, and it, I'm not sure anything's been introduced yet, but I expect there will be new efforts to solve this uh, through legislation. And I think that could be even a more efficient path than what we're dealing with through the court system, because the court system will make a determination, assuming it gets all the way there, about 
XRP and did Ripple engage or did I personally or Chris Larson personally engage in selling unregistered securities? But that won't solve the problem for everyone else. It'll provide a precedent. But really, I think, you know, if we could get clarity through legislation, that could be very powerful for the whole industry. And by the way, one more thing, and I know I'm rambling, but just bear with me one sec. You know, having been a student of the internet back in the late 90s, one of the reasons why the United States was such a early investor and leader in the internet technologies and companies around it is because there was that clarity. There was certainty. Sure. And when they have those things, investors and entrepreneurs come into those markets. And instead, what we have here in the United States, we don't have those things. And so you see a lot of that happening outside of the United States, which I think is unfortunate uh, you know, for, for here in the United States. You mentioned the UK having this, a very clear tax, you know, they, I think they called it the, the uh, Token Taxonomy Act or something like that. You know, that really differentiate different assets by use case, uh, which I think is, you know, did provide leadership in the UK. And I think Singapore has provided a lot of leadership in Japan as another example. Uh, so on that note, you know, with the lawsuit and all you, you remember you tweeting something about getting some more gray hairs and things like that, you know, obviously a stressful situation. <laughs> um, has Ripple lost any customers? Has this put a roadblock in gaining new customers? Can you tell us about that? Well, look, I actually, you know, there's a little bit mostly good news here. You know, I think we publicly have shared that we've signed over 20 new customers since the SEC brought their lawsuit. Uh, you know, we processed about 3 million transactions last year on RippleNet, which was, you know, up 5x year on year. You know, we expect continued very strong growth this year. And so in a lot of ways, I feel really good about that. Um, about well over 90% of our customers going into this lawsuit were non-US customers. Um, and, you know, of the 20 plus that we've signed, none of them have been US customers, not surprisingly. So look, Ripple has always been a very global company. As we talked about earlier, XRP trading has always been very, very global with you know, XRP liquidity on about 200 exchanges around the world. You know, we have though, it has caused some headwinds you know, here in the United States. You know, very well known, uh, our partnership with MoneyGram, we both kind of mutually agreed to step away from for the time being. But we also, you know, as I already commented, we've been able to grow in some ways, accelerate our growth. Uh, we've made a couple big deals. One, uh, Tranglo, we agreed to acquire about 40% of a, a pretty pretty large uh, payment provider in Southeast Asia. Uh, they provide they do about 20 million transactions a year and about $4 billion of value. So, uh, you know, we, we hired an amazing leader in Southeast Asia, Brooks Enswile, uh, who you know, joined us from uh, Uber which has been you know, great to kind of uh, jumpstart some of that leadership as well. Yeah, no, I, so you mentioned Tranglo. I also saw Novati is, is, if I'm saying that right, is a new customer of yours. They will be leveraging ODL. Correct. Yeah, I mean, look, it, it, ODL on-demand liquidity is the product we offer that allows customers to tap into XRP as a way to shuttle liquidity. Uh, you know, our customers have loved it. We have a lot of demand for it. Uh, you know, obviously, the, the, again, the, the SEC's actions here in the United States have kind of stymied that. But, you know, Asimo, Novati, um, you know, these are all customers who are benefiting from ODL and uh, even despite the SEC's actions continue to do so. So I want to ask about, and I know you, you probably can't talk a lot about this because uh, things are under NDA and, and all that, but I'm certain you're, you're, you're speaking to banks in the United States and payment service providers in the United States. Uh, have those conversations been put on hold, you know, given the lack of clarity as a whole, even before the lawsuit? And are you, you know, how, can you tell us about the, the dynamic of that? Is it like, hey, we'll talk to you six months from now once this is all over or whatever it may be? Yeah, I mean, look, I can talk about this directionally. Uh, I mean, for certain here in the United States, it has been a constant headwind in the past years. And it went from being a headwind to just, hey, we're going to stop. Yeah. You know, it, for U.S. companies to engage, particularly U.S. public companies that are regulated by the SEC, uh, you know, it takes some real conviction and uh, you know, risk tolerance to, to do that. Now, in the SEC's, uh, in, the, the, in the court, the SEC has actually, you know, somewhat ironically said that they 
have not taken the position that the secondary markets are uh, you know, selling of unregistered securities and that you know, don't blame the SEC for that. I mean, I think they said this as part of the John Deaton uh, case that he filed in federal court in Rhode Island. But you know, their argument and retort to his case was, and I'm paraphrasing, of course, but you know, like, hey, don't blame us, blame the exchanges. The exchanges are the ones that delisted, not us. And you're just like, come on, you know, you're supposed to be working for the people. You're working to protect investors. You know, it didn't feel, uh, to me, it didn't feel like consistent with the mission of the SEC. Sure, and I think uh, they, they're hearing about it on Twitter. <laughs> they're there are different handles, um, which I think rightfully so. Now, you know, given uh, the, the evolution of Ripple as a company, the adoption of XRP worldwide, different companies building on the XRP ledger, so on and so forth, what's the vision as of today uh, for XRP? Is it still the bridge asset use case, micropayments with coil, web monetization, things like that? Can you, can you give us an overview? Well, I mean, you did a pretty good job right there. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yes, you know, look, XRP uh, is an extremely efficient digital asset that, for payments in particular. Uh, you know, for Ripple as a company, you know, we've started with cross-border payments uh, and using XRP around on-demand liquidity. But, you know, Ripple also, we're expanding in, you know, last year, I think in either late Q3 or early Q4, we announced a product called Line of Credit uh, and kind of to start playing in the lending space, which is really an extension of some of the services we're already offering to the, those same customers. And, you know, you should expect that we will continue to, you know, think about that customer set and how we can continue to add value and, you know, more to come on that. And we're excited about what that holds. You know, one of the things I've talked publicly about a little bit is uh, I was, you know, because we have a long form interview here, uh, when I was in business school, uh, Jeff Bezos in 1996 came to our class and uh, he talked about Amazon and he talked about Amazon, the bookseller. And Amazon was competitive with Barnes and Noble and Borders books. And, you know, that was it. And I've said that, you know, I view Amazon is to books as Ripple is to cross-border payments uh, as something that I do believe there are many compelling use cases. There are many compelling vertical opportunities, vertical markets to apply blockchain technologies to. And the XRP Ledger is an extremely efficient blockchain. And so there's many other use cases that we think about and we think we could apply our expertise in enterprise sales, as well as the efficiency of the XRP Ledger to solve some of those problems. And so uh, I'm excited about you know, what, what I think will be ahead. Uh, you know, we're, we're almost 500 people strong and trying to hire 150 or 200 people through from now until the end of the year. Uh, so we're, we're still certainly in the face of, you know, some headwinds from the United States SEC. We're still uh, in, investing heavily in, in, in growing. Um, I'm excited to hear that. And I, there's a question that came from the community I have to ask, and I'm interested as well the central banks that you are currently working with and the private ledger and issuing CBDCs on the XRP ledger, and um, things along those lines. What can you tell us there? I, I noticed probably not a lot, but as much as you can hint to or. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not going to hint. I'm just going to try to answer the question as best I can. Look, uh, first of all, I hope, you know, everyone who follows Ripple closely and follows the XRP community closely can appreciate when we're working with particularly large banks, really any customer, you know, we try to respect, you know, any announcements to, to respect what they want to announce when they want to announce it, things like that. And so that sometimes that's frustrating for us. You know, I remember there was a certain patent filing that came from one large bank that referenced Ripple in a certain way and of course generated a lot of questions and I didn't have much to say about that. Uh, you know, there was some attention you know, because some central bankers' schedules are public information. Uh, so I, you know, I've seen the, the, the rumors out there. I'm going to go back to what I said earlier. The XRP ledger is extremely efficient. It's extremely scalable. And you, it, you can issue other assets on the XRP ledger. And so 
we have, I have said publicly, you know, we often are asked by central banks to come and talk to them about whether it's the XRP ledger or about, you know, how we think about uh, the future of payments using digital assets. Uh, and, you know, because of our unique position with, you know, really compelling technology and the, the ability to offer a private version of, you know, the open source technology is XRP Ledger, you know, central banks can manage and create and manage their own digital currency. So, uh, again, we haven't been shy about the fact, yes, we're having the conversations with many banks, many central banks around the world. Uh, you know, we did some research, I think we publicly shared that, you know, we think about 80% of central banks around the world are actively investigating one way or another what CBDCs could mean for, for their technology or for their uh, economy. So, uh, you know, we'll, we'll continue to do that. And when we have announcements, we'll certainly do so. So I recently interviewed Chris Giancarlo, former CFTC chairman, heading up the Digital Dollar Project. What are your thoughts on Look, China looks like it's beating the U.S. at this point when it comes to a CBDC. And uh, do you see I, the dollar losing reserve status as a result? And and look, this is a small island countries that have got their CBDCs live already. What are your thoughts on the entire situation? Well, I guess first of all, I, I don't think it's fair to compare a digital, a, a tokenized dollar to you know what some small economies have done, you know, that's, it's just like not even the same, you know, it's a much more complicated topic. There's no doubt in my mind that uh, the, the Chinese Communist Party has been very strategic and I think very smart about how they have approached this. You know, I thought, you know, some of you I'm sure have, you have seen, and I'm sure that your viewers have seen, you know, Peter Thiel's interview last week or maybe the week before talking about the implications of what's going on in China and, you know, uh, even the potential implications of, of Bitcoin. Uh, look, it, I, I try to look at how do I solve a customer's problem and how do I create value for that customer? I do think about big picture where this could go and where it could end up. But I think sometimes people spend so much time talking about the, the vision and not enough time talking about, okay, what do we need to do tomorrow? How, how do we actually catalyze these things? And look, I, one of the reasons I think Ripple has been successful is because we try to balance the big picture. We have a vision around enabling an internet of value and around enabling XRP as that bridge asset that can be universal. Uh, but in order to get there, you've got to have a really clear, you know, blocking and tackling kind of bit by bit. And so uh, I, I think the US has, from a macro point of view, fallen behind in this industry. I'm not saying that about, you know, should the US do a central bank issue digital asset? I'm more just saying, when there's not regulatory clarity, you know, dollars and entrepreneurs go elsewhere. Uh, and you have seen, you know, China provide leadership here. What's the long-term implication for the dollars of reserve currency? You know, I think it's much too early to, to opine on that. So there's been mentions and talks like the, the, the Fed payments now, I think has endorsed Ripple and the technology and the work you guys have been doing. Um, has there been ongoing conversations with them? Are you supporting them in any way with coming up with a CBDC or whatever it may be? We're talking to lots of governments around the world. Okay. <laughs> now, there's-, there's I mean, if, I start, if I start commenting on specific <laughs> governments we're talking about, then it's like, it's, you know, I'm not, it's, it's a game that's like, look, uh, I'm not gonna uh, provide transparency and clarity to kind of all, all of those pieces. And uh, right. suffice it to say, you know, again, I'll go back to just, the XRP ledger is extremely efficient. It's ex ex efficient from a, a cost per transaction, a speed of transaction. And look, in one of the things we haven't talked about today, the, the, the energy footprint of these technologies, it matters. It really, really matters. I, it, I feel I'm always been someone who has cared about, you know, how do we do well by the environment? And, you know, the, the reality is that uh, some you know, proof of work as a mechanism for validating transactions uh, requires a lot of energy. I, I, I've given props to the Ethereum community for their migration. Uh, and, you know, we announced last week the Crypto Climate Accord, of which uh, you know, many participants, including Joe Lubin from the Ethereum community, are very actively supporting, which I think is phenomenal. So, and you often get criticized because of this. 
I think you mentioned before, you hold Bitcoin, you're bullish on Bitcoin, but the idea of proof of work is what is the issue, right? It's not that, okay, you're inherently angry at Bitcoin or you don't like Bitcoin, but rather the process of validating transactions and payments, it's not scalable, obviously lots of energy. So that's you know what you're trying to emphasize and that there's a better technology out there, for example, like the XRP ledger. Yeah, I mean, look, it, I mean, I hope it's not so much the last part of what you said is a little bit different than what I'd say. But one of the things I believe in life is that the first step to solving a problem is admitting you have one. Hmm. And if you don't admit something's a problem, then you don't focus on solving it. And I, I think, uh, you know, when I, I, I get criticized for a lot of things, <laughs> some of them, <laughs> some of them I, you know, I don't even know what to say about some of them, but, you know, it, this is one where I, it's like, look, I, I'm not, I, I'm very bullish on Bitcoin. I'm very, very bullish on Bitcoin, period. That doesn't mean I can't also think that the mechanism for proof of work and the fact that 60 to 7% of mining happens in China on almost entirely coal, plow, coal powered energy. Look, I, I think we just all should care and, and you know, it, could the Bitcoin blockchain use other mechanisms for validation? Yes, good. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not saying it should, I'm not saying it in the, at the end of the day, I'm very bullish on Bitcoin. And I think Bitcoin doing well is good for the entire crypto industry. Got it. Now there's a question that came from the community about the XRP escrow. This is often a hot topic of discussion. And you know, after doing, doing a lot of research and understanding the escrow and, and the setup that you, you have there, um, what's the plan for the escrow moving forward? And could that, could there be, there's a question that comes up, could you burn some of it? Is that a possibility? Distribute it to other authorities, whoever, I don't know. What's the plan there and the vision for that? Well, look, first of all, I think there's some, um, two answers to this. One, there's some misinformation out there, right? I mean, some people like to position the escrow as somehow Ripple dumping XRP in the community. It makes no sense for Ripple or any of the people around Ripple to dump XRP, right? That's not in the best interest of the XRP ecosystem of which Ripple is a very important piece as, as am I. Uh, so, you know, look, I, I think, uh, the way the escrow was set up, it was done in the in, with the intent of let's provide maximum transparency. Mm -hmm. Let's make sure that people totally understand what's happening here. And, you know, I, I, I've used it as kind of a, a, a call to action for others in the crypto industry to be equally transparent. And, you know, in some ways, I think that transparency has come back to bite us a little bit, ironically and frustratingly. But you look, I'm always open and interested in new ideas that are good for the XRP ecosystem. I don't rule anything out. Uh, and I think to the extent that uh, there's things that make sense for the XRP ecosystem, then certainly Ripple would look at that. Um, where do you see Ripple in three to five years? Well, I mean, you know, I'll probably borrow from a couple of things I've already said, you know, at, at the most macro sense, Ripple has had a vision that Chris Larson articulated. And I remember interviewing him, interviewing with him uh, when I joined the company. And, you know, from that first meeting, you know, he talked about this idea of an internet of value to truly let value move the way information moves today. And I think we, we all have been kind of desensitized to how much friction there is in payments in all aspects of our lives. And if you really can reduce that friction to zero or close to zero, I think you can unlock a lot of compelling opportunities. Uh, and it, you know, that, that vision around Ripple has, has not changed. And I think mm. certainly we think about, you know, how do we go from you know, moving billions of dollars through RippleNet and billions of dollars through our on-demand liquidity product to, you know, add zeros behind that. And over the next three to five years, we hope we can, can grow into those. But also, as I said, I think, you know, we think about how to leverage the XRP ledger or other compelling use cases. And uh, there certainly are some that we are investigating. There's some that we kind of watch. There's some that we've invested in. You know, I think we very publicly shared that, I think if not, if we aren't the largest 
independent investor in uh, crypto. We're, we're close to it. And uh, we invest a lot of other crypto projects. Some of them don't involve XRP uh, because we think, because I, I genuinely believe like all boats can rise. Sure. Um, so I have to ask this question because we had the Coinbase IPO this past week and I want to get your thoughts on that. And when Ripple IPO? <laughs> Look, I said... 14 or 15 months ago at Davos, uh, the World Economic Forum, I said, look, I, I didn't think Ripple would be the first crypto IPO. And I also said, I certainly think we'd be the last. You know, I think, I do think the Coinbase IPO is kind of a Netscape moment for the crypto industry. And I think we're going to continue to see an immense amount of value created over the next, I'll say, 10 years in the crypto industry. And I think Coinbase was kind of a, a harbinger of things to come. Uh, now, the, the tricky part, for the, the ripple part of that question is, you know, the, the United States, if we were to go public here in the United States through an IPO process, uh, the United States Securities and Exchange Commission has to approve that. Uh, as you may have noticed, we're in a little bit of disagreement right now with the Securities Exchange Commission. So I think uh, we need to resolve one before we spend too much time on the other. Got it. Um... I'll, I'll leave it at that. Uh, there's another question, but I don't think you probably <laughs> may have to answer it. Um, all right, I want to switch gears a bit and talk about the market as a whole. Um, obviously, we, we're in a bull market. We had a run up with a huge correction uh, over the weekend, um, but it seems to be recovering a bit. You know, what are your thoughts on how the market has grown and since you entered in and started working at Ripple? Um, and, and Bitcoin, I think getting a lot of adoption people putting on their balance sheets, accepting as payment, Tesla. Uh, we just heard Time Magazine doing the same thing. What are your thoughts on, on that? Well, so look, if I step, zoom out as, as far as possible, you know, to when I got, well, I first got exposed to Bitcoin uh, at the Dialogue Conference uh, years and years ago, like, wow, you know, we're somewhere, I don't know where we are today, but we were at $2.2 trillion uh, within the last, you know, handful of days. Uh, and I think you know the, the breadth of activity from the developer community is just astoundingly positive, and I think you know bodes extremely positively for for what's ahead. Uh, I, I also think, and as many people you know predicted, and part of the the vision for some of these technologies, you know you have M2 money supply here in the United States grew about twenty five percent year on year. Uh, I expect, given the stimulus we're seeing happen right now, we should expect it to grow about another 20 or 25% next year. Uh, when you take an asset and you make a whole lot more of it and you devalue you know, what was already there, and that's called inflation. Uh, and so I think there's going to continue to be some macro trends, which are very positive for uh, the crypto industry at large. And... Uh, you know, I, I, I've given up trying to predict, you know, the short-term gyrations uh, that, you know, happen. Uh, you know, sometimes things happen where you think the price of a particular crypto asset might be, to, might go up and it goes down. And, you know, so predicting the short-term dynamics is really hard. But again, I, I take a big picture look and I think uh, it, there's a, the crypto market has a long way to go to, to reach maturity. And I think that bodes well for the future. And, you know, there's so many things that are happening, uh, NFTs and uh, obviously multiple digital asset projects popping up here and there, different cryptocurrencies, uh, central governments are putting together their CBDCs. So we're, it seems like we're moving to that token economy of full digitization of everything, artwork, money. And, and uh, you know, I want to get your thoughts on that because you're on the building side and, and do, do you you see anything new on the horizon that you guys are paying attention to? Like, you know what? I think this might be the next thing that might be big and in, in the crypto industry and blockchain industry. I mean, uh, I'm going to dodge that question. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to tell you right now. I'm dodging that one. Okay. It's not because I'm not trying to answer it. It's like, I, I'm not going to, uh, you know, share. Here's what Ripple thinks are the, the next kind of big misunderstood or not fully seen opportunities. Look, I think NFTs are here to stay. I think, uh, yeah, as you said, the, the tokenization of many, many assets, I think, is underway. And I think that's exciting. I think it does go back to something we talked about earlier around the, the, the energy consumption of proof of work. You know, 
if you have, you know, I, I think the, the opportunity in NFTs is really around the longer tail where, you know, it is going to matter if you have $50 of gas fees associated with an NFT transaction, like that, that's going to limit the market. It doesn't matter when you're buying, you know, a hundred thousand dollar piece of artwork, but it does matter when, you know, it might be you're, you're trying to uh, trade a hundred dollar baseball card. So, uh, I think, you know, I, I didn't see the explosion around NFTs coming, if you will. Uh, it certainly has exceeded my, what I would have guessed, but I also, am a, I'm a big believer. Uh, you know, to your point, you know, you've commented a couple of times around, you know, pe- more and more people accepting different crypto assets as payment. You know, look, I, I think there is a interesting irony that Tesla has been such a leader well, they have been the leader around, you know, awareness of you know, carbon emissions from obviously cars. Uh, yet, by the same token, uh, you know, understanding the implications of Tesla and SpaceX and Elon Musk, who clearly has done more for protecting, you know, the, the planet from carbon emissions than probably any other person that I know of, then leans into you know, uh, an existing framework that is uh, around proof of work that, you know, produces a lot of carbon. So, you know, I, I think that, that, that what we saw with companies like MicroStrategy uh, and Tesla, in, in when I think I tweeted out when MicroStrategy uh, announced what they had done, I think I tweeted out something like, they may be the first, but it certainly won't be the last. And I think that still remains true today. Um, on the note of the you know carbon footprint, do you feel it, at this moment it's a necessary evil because of the larger evil of I don't know money printing and the, and the super centralization of different aspects of government and so forth? That while it Bitcoin is not getting rid of banks and so on and so forth, uh, certainly not, but it does give some power back to the common folks of, uh, and the decentralized nature of the internet. Well, I want to make sure I understand. Well, I'm sorry. When you asked that question again, I'll make sure I understand it because I'm not sure I totally picked it up. Well, I think you said kind of the juxtaposition of Tesla being about the environment yeah. and so forth, but yet Elon adopted Bitcoin, right? But is it, well, my point is, is it fair to criticize Elon and Tesla and, and given that Bitcoin's pros, I think we certainly understand the cons and that needs to be fixed, but the pros outweigh the cons at this point. And in oh, yeah. I mean, again, I'm going to keep emphasizing, I am not trying in any way, shape, or form to trying to attack Bitcoin. Uh, I, I mean, this is a, a full-throated, I am bullish on Bitcoin, period. I'm very bullish. That doesn't mean we can't be intellectually honest and think about how can we do something better. Sure. Uh, do, do I think Bitcoin and all the benefits of Bitcoin, as you pointed out, the decentralization uh, pieces are relevant. We can, you know, some people yell at me for saying this, but, you know, this, this past weekend, as you probably followed, you know, there were some blackouts in China, which took uh, the, the, the hash rate down by 20 to 40 percent, which also coincided with, you know, a big drop in the price of Bitcoin. You know, uh, we can debate a little bit some of those decentralization points. Suffice it to say, all I'm trying to point out is I think we just need to be intellectually honest and not try to, you know, fight with each other about things that, you know, we, I, I want to spend the time convincing Janet Yellen that she's wrong. I want to convince Bill Gates that he's wrong. Right. When they make comments about, you know, I think Bill Gates was quoted as saying roughly, you know, uh, a Bitcoin transaction is the least efficient mechanism for a payment that man has ever created or something like that. Like, I, let, let's prove him wrong. Let's also acknowledge that Bitcoin has some things it's probably really good at, and there's other digital assets that might be really good at other things. Right. Um, okay, so we're running up on time. So I wanna wrap it up here with some rapid fire questions, such as what's your favorite food? I eat more ice cream than anyone you know. <laughs> uh, favorite musician or band? Kygo. Nice. Uh, favorite movie? Wedding Crashers. <laughs> Good one. Uh, I don't think wedding crashes come out earlier in my life. That I think that's <laughs> I'm too old for that now. Uh, favorite book? You know, one book that actually was pretty formative for me. I read around uh, the time Netscape went public was a book called Snow Crash by Neil Stevenson, which was uh, you know an early kind of sci-fi. Uh, 
art, not artificial reality, but you know, kind of, uh, uh, I can't remember the I'm spacing the words, but anyway, fabulous book. You should read Snow Crash if you haven't. I'll definitely check that one out. And uh, when you're not at Ripple, you know, doing your CEO duties, what are you doing for fun as, as a hobby? That's a tough one. You know, I, I uh, have kids, I've got a job, I, uh, <laughs> I don't have a lot of time. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I guess I'll say uh, just because it's, you know, right after ski season, I, I was able to hit the slopes a couple of times this season and really enjoyed some skiing time. Awesome. Well, Brad, uh, pleasure chatting with you. And uh, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us today. Absolutely. I enjoyed it. Thanks a lot for all you're doing and the, the leadership you're providing, providing this information out there. Thank you.